If you look at the 136th Psalm, we'll read verses 2 through 4. Give thanks to the God of gods, his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, his love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, his love endures forever. Let's pray. Father, as we look at the titles of who you are, may it remind us of who we are. And when we see who we are in light of who you are, may it lead us to give thanks. May we be reminded of how dependent upon you we are and how thankful we should be for what you have done for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to go back to Tuesday. Not specific events, just general events that took part 500 years apart. The first event would be the urchins in their little costumes knocking on doors with an attitude and an understanding that very simply this. You owe them candy. And if you don't give them candy, they then, for some reason, have a right to vandalize your property. Now, they express it with two uh, simple words joined by one conjunction trick or tree, but the concept and the perspective of the trick-or-treater is, is the candy in your bowl belongs in their bag and it is their right. 500 years earlier, when we didn't refer to it as Halloween, we referred to it as Hallow's Eve or the evening before All Saints Day, which came on November 1st. A dramatic shift occurred in the history of the church where the perspective and understanding that somehow and in some way what man did was basically saying to God, trick or treat. What I have accomplished, you must owe me, was shattered when 95 theses or theses were, not, were nailed to the door of the Wittenberg Church by Martin Luther, beginning what we now know as the Protestant Reformation. The reason we gather and speak of the reality that salvation is based regardless of what we do, but on the actions of God's grace and the response only of our faith. That there is no way in which we are to earn our salvation because it is unearnable. A matter of perspective. One perspective says it's about me. The other perspective says it's about he. And the psalmist here in Psalm 136 helps us to see the perspective of what it means for us to understand the perspective of who we are and from who we are how we give thanks. It begins with this concept in verse 2, that we're to give thanks to the God. Not just any God, but the God of gods. In a world in which much is worshipped, Paul will speak in Romans of the fact that when we cannot figure out who to worship, we'll create something to worship out of brick and out of stone and out of stick. But the God of gods is the one whom we worship. Which means, he who is above us, we who are below him. There's an order here. We who are below give our thanks to he who is above us. There's a general understanding in human relationships as well. We are supposed to be thankful for the fact. Let me illustrate the fact that we're supposed to be thankful for. When I was... Yet a young child, <laughs> maybe a seventh of my age now, six or seven, somewhere in that range, I came up with this wonderful solution. I believe that I deserved more than uh, I was receiving. I believe that I deserved to be treated in a way that was more than I was receiving. I didn't think I got or was receiving what I deserved, so I had made up a wonderful plan. 
And this wonderful plan was that the door facing west, I would walk out it, I would go out on State Road 234, or maybe County Road 500 West was less traveled, and I would just begin to become like Cain from Kung Fu. I would wander the earth. It was time for me to set out on my own and run away. <laughs> My plans were derailed when one who was above me said to the one who was below him, the one whom he would later remind that I created you, and I can take you out and make another one just like you, <laughs> said to me, what are you taking with you? I said, well, I'm going to put some clothes in a suitcase. He said, well, that's my suitcase. I said, well, they're my clothes. He said, uh, did you buy them? Uh, no. Well, then you can't take your clothes. Uh, well, I'll take the clothes on my back. Did you buy those? Uh, no. You need to take those off. There was a moment when I was still on this plan, when now, with no shoes on, no socks on, my t-shirt had been removed, my shorts had been removed, and I was about to grab the door when I was reminded that I was still possessing something that did not belong technically to me because it came from above to the one who was below. When my plans of what my perspective of how great I was was ultimately transformed. Because it's one thing to run away. Oh, our ancestors realized what it means to be below, to run away from the one who is above. But they also realized what I recognized grabbing that aluminum door with the understanding that the trowel also had to be dropped. Where I realized... It's not, uh, there's shame in finding oneself naked. There's also shame in finding oneself naked on a state highway or even an unguarded or barely traveled county road with no shoes. It's a battle of perspective. <laughs> the psalmist here says, we give thanks because of the God of gods. Psalm 8 reminds us of who that God is. Psalm 8 verses 4 and 5 what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. Now, it doesn't say that we have no value, but there is a pecking order. We are created below the God of gods. Oh, and is he above? The Apostle Paul said it this way, Ephesians chapter 1, God is far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. God of gods, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. So, as the stupid naked kid had to recognize, when he really needed to change his perspective and to give an understanding of giving thanks, <laughs> one aspect of the reason that we give thanks is simply because he's God and we ain't. That's right. The reality that he's mindful of us. The reality that he gives us any honor. That he gives us any glory. Not because he has to. He's not my dad who somebody's going to come in the cosmic child protection services and take God away because he didn't give us clothes to wear. Who's going to take him away? <laughs> What are you going to build with your hands? What kind of Canaanite thing they worship is, it, is going to be able to defeat him? It's that moment in 1 Kings chapter 18 where Elijah fights the prophets of Baal who say, our God's bigger than your God. Elijah says, prove it. And Elijah sits there as the wood gets damper and damper, as the time drags on, no, the wood doesn't get damper yet. The time just drags on and on. They're waiting for this Baal to drop his fire from heaven and prove that he is who he is. Elijah finally gets bored and says, sure, your God's not on vacation. i sure somebody shouldn't knock on the uh, room of relief to make sure he's not just a little preoccupied and he's got some indigestion problems. When he says, let me prove who I've got. 
because of who he is, because of what he does, because he is above and we are below. He's do things for anything he does. But I don't know about you. Sometimes it's hard to give that idea because I still have that trick-or-treat mentality. You owe me. Anybody know the person who's going to take trick-or-treat with them to the holiday of Thanksgiving? The person who shows up with nothing more than that can of purple slime? Hey, hey, hey. Thinking that they've accomplished something and they've made the meal? That's the best part. I mean, look, if you can still see the ridges from the inside of the can as your part of the Thanksgiving dinner... Nobody's, nobody dreams of can ridges as their idea of what Thanksgiving is, right? <laughs> the golden brown color of the skin of the turkey. The wafting smell of the dressing. Those are the things. But can you imagine the person who shows up with the store-bought brand, with the dent in the side of it, because, you know, they went all out this year, thinking to themselves, I have made Thanksgiving, you should all bow before me. <laughs> Giving no thanks to the person who got up at 4 a.m., reaching into a half-cold bird to pull out giblets out of a bag, and then broasted, broasted the thing, uh, roasted the thing with the constant use of the baster and the juices. <laughs> Laid out the table. Guess what? He is so far above us. We're just people with cranberry sauce. That's right. In a can. That's right. And even that, he made the can and the cranberries. And we'll find out in a minute the ability to make the sauce. Because he is God. And we are the creature. We owe him. But in verse 5, it goes beyond that. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. You can change that word if you'd like. Maybe the idea of Lord doesn't really ring true. How about king? How about majesty? How about master? We give thanks from who we are because we're servants and he's the master. Who deserves the thanks in the relationship between a servant and a master? It's the master. It's the master who makes the provisions. It's the master who makes the care. And I know that we live in a culture where that term was misused and abused and sometimes we fear to talk in these terms. But I remind you that after we talk about God being the master of masters or the Lord of lords or the king of kings, that he distinguishes and differentiates him here in this psalm from the kings and the masters who have abused that power throughout the centuries by reminding us of what we looked at last week and those two attributes of him, that he is a God of love and he doesn't change, it endures for ever. But the relationship again is if a master is to be thanked because his servants, because he is deserving to be thanked by his servants. This leads and this principle transfers over into our own relationships. So maybe you're thinking how do I apply this when I've gathered around the turkey? Even if I am the turkey who thought I did something great because I brought the napkins or I brought the plastic fork. Ephesians chapter 6 uses the same principle in the relationship we have between God as God and God as master when he talks about how we relate one to another. Maybe as a child, instead of being that rebel who believes I deserve everything, and make the application of Ephesians 6 that children should be obedient and thankful to their parents. Maybe, 
as Ephesians 6 speaks of this master-servant or employer-employee relationship. I am thankful for what's provided by those who have provided the opportunity I have to be able to serve in a way to provide in our culture for ourselves, in ancient cultures, where I was provided for by what I did. Jesus uses this illustration of what it means for a master to express gratitude to grateful servants. Although there's also the warning in chapter 25 of what he does with an ungrateful servant. It is Matthew chapter 25, not Psalm 8, 4 through 5, no matter what the screen may say behind me. You'd almost think the minister forgot to change one part of the slide when he copied the text. After a long time, the master of those servants returned. This is after the master had given one servant five talents and one servant two talents and one servant one talent. And instead of them deciding that they could, well, two out of three decided that while the master was gone, they would were, while the other one thought the master's gone, so Jimmy cracked corn and he didn't care. When the master returned... It said, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received. See, we're thankful for what we have received and how we've been taken care of. The five talents brought the other five that he had earned for the master. Master, he said, you entrusted me with these talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. What does it mean that God is a good master? Here's the illustration Jesus gives. You have been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. We're not just thankful that we have a master who takes care of us. But we have a master who blesses us. Count your many blessings. Make them one by one. And see what you've accomplished for everyone to tell you how great you are. No, that's not how the song is. <laughs> Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. And you will see what God has done. Amen. He's owed thanks because of who he is. He's owed thanks by those of us who are in the position of receiving. Even when we give back, we're returning that which we have received. He's mindful of us. He cares for us. And speaking of his mind, oh, give thanks to him who alone does great wonders. His love endures forever. The truth is that we are just imitators to the originator. We'll talk about this more next week when we look at what God has done and why we should be thankful for that. But the truth is, our origin begins with Him. That's right. You get some great idea? You get some great new concept? All you're doing is using the stuff that's already available and making something new. And sometimes it's not even new. It's just a brand new package on an old idea. <coughs> on Friday, my brother decided to be a brother. Without me knowing it, he and his new bride went to visit my mother on Friday, and somehow he apparently got a hold of my mother's laptop. He didn't just get a hold of my, brother's, my mother's laptop. He apparently thinks that he's been adopted by Don Brown, because while he was on her laptop, he decided that he could use her Facebook account any way he wished to. Which means the picture of him and I from 2008 at Wrigley Field, which is one of the five pictures that shows up on my, you, you've got five pictures that are pinned to your, your page. Suddenly, about 3.30 in the afternoon on Friday, I had a message that my mother had commented on one of my photos, which I thought was really odd because I hadn't really put any new photos up this week other than bobbleheads, and she doesn't care about those. <laughs> And then when I clicked on it, it's a picture from almost a decade ago, and I thought, this doesn't seem right. And then there was this comment. 
Matt is my favorite with the name Deborah Riggs attached to it. <laughs> and I thought, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> so I made a phone call. My mother answered the phone and I said, is Matt at your house by any chance? Yeah, how'd you know? I said, I had a guest. You guys have fun with your visit. And then about 30 seconds later, my phone gave me another little notification ding. And now my brother on his phone responded to my brother on my mother's laptop with a comment under my mother's comment that said, thanks, Mom, I always knew it, or something like that. <laughs> so I know he's wanting attention, so I gave him attention. I screenshotted that picture. And I put this conversation, and you may have seen it, I said, look, watch Matt have a conversation with himself. My brother, unable to let it go, felt that it was time to take it up a notch. So he went to Google, and he found a box of constructs pictures and put it on my Facebook page. Now, the reason I've used this illustration is to get to the constructs, because there are two things about constructs you should know. Constructs were a toy in the mid-80s that were nothing new. They were just plastic versions of an erector set. That's all they were. Secondly, you've heard the story probably too many times. It's the Christmas gift from 1986 that I rejected, which means my brother's response isn't even original. I've been hearing this nonsense for 30-plus years. He's not original. He's an imitator of everyone who has been doing that about a toy that wasn't an original, it was an imitator. Or, if you remember last summer, when we went through Ecclesiastes, remember what Solomon said about this world? There is nothing new under the sun. But the sun was new. We'll talk about that next week. It was originated at some point. The things by which we create and make. We're imitating the one who took nothing and made something. Preview for next week. <laughs> but we were made just a little lower from the one who was above. We were graciously cared for by the one to whom we owe our allegiance. And he is the one to whom we attempt to follow. Knowing that we're still separated from him. And his fact that his ways are above our ways. He's the one alone who does the great wonders. Or as Isaiah will say of him. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. He would have come up with something more creative, is what I'm saying, if he had decided to troll me on Facebook than my brother could have ever imagined. So when we give thanks, when we pull out the green piece of post-it note that's in our sermon outline in this week's bulletin, we give thanks because, well, who else are we going to give thanks to? Who else is the God of gods? He deserves it for that alone. We give thanks out of a sense of obligation that he is the master and we are the servants. And we give thanks because we realize that all we're really doing is giving credit to the one who was much more creative than we've ever been in our most creative. Before we were, he was. Before we even came up with this concept, it already existed because he's the one who brings the wonders. Speaking of songs, 
You ever recognize and realize that the people who are really quality and the people that we recognize as geniuses are always quick to point out who they kind of imitated from to begin? Mm -hmm. Their creativity came because there was someone creative before them. If you want to, just stay with the title of music. As Genesis 4 points out, before there was a Lennon and a McCartney, there was a fellow named Jubal, who was the one who popularized music, says the book of Genesis. Imitators. But you know what happened in Genesis 1, before there was Genesis 4? There are these nice poetic sections in the involvement of, again, spoiler alert for next week, in the creation account that Hebrew scholars tell me is probably the idea that the world wasn't just spoken into existence. It was likely sung into existence. There's nothing to be one of the sung. We're imitating that which originated. That's right. So, two things today. Number one, if you have come to a point in your life where you have realized that the goodness that is God you forsook with your own actions and thought that your cranberry sauce is greater than anything he could ever make. If you have had the attitude where you could walk up to his pearly gates and demand that you receive your treats or you're going to pull the trick. <laughs> and you've come to the conclusion that as an unfaithful servant, your only hope is what the master has done. And you have responded to your arrogance and your sin and pride and have corrected because of what Jesus has done and what Luther reminded us of 500 years ago, that our only hope was in the grace provided by God. If you have solved that relational problem, then the invitation for you today is to grab the green piece of post-it note out of your bulletin or grab one of the green post-it notes on the back window and write from what it means that he is God and he is Lord and he is the originator, what you are thankful for. And I'll ask you to post that on the back window. But if today, maybe your thoughts are, I've always kind of thought that I was the center of my universe. I always thought that I should be the one in charge. And I need to know what it takes to set this situation right, set this relationship right, then as the worship team comes, we offer an invitation like we do every Sunday in which we can allow and share with you the message that the one who was above came to the place that was below. The one who was the master became the servant. And he was the originator of the process of salvation when he died on a cross offering us our only hope to be redeemed and born again and gave us something to imitate when it comes to a spiritual life in him. If you need to make that decision this morning, I'm going to encourage you to come as we sing and as we give thanks this morning.